emphasis on the on the idea of re restarting the convergence process. It's very much part of the political debate here and in other member states, I think, that the the purpose of the economic and monetary policies must always be brought back to what kind of convergence we were talking about. And we we're talking about economic and social convergence, which appear in the Commission's papers, but uh, for some of us don't appear to get sufficient emphasis. May, may I just open the discussion by asking for a comment from you about the pace of some of the changes that are, that are being contemplated. As you said, the, um, the development of a European Deposit Insurance Scheme is controversial. There's a three-stage process uh, being proposed, which will take some time to put together. Um, we have the single resolution mechanism, which has new bail-in provisions in it, uh, which seem, although I may be wrong, uh, to have been rather ignored in recent actions to save banks in Italy, and I think perhaps also in Spain. And we have a continuing problem of non-performing loans weighing down on the bank's balance sheets. And we have a particular issue with, with mortgage loans in, in, in this country. Um, some might fear that as we're wending our political way to, to getting the various solutions in place there, we will be overtaken by another banking difficulty. And we will again find ourselves with insufficient means uh, to deal with the issue. Uh, do you think there's a danger there? Um, uh, and if there is, is there any appreciation of, of the urgency of getting to conclusions on these issues? Well, absolutely. Um, in a um, perfect world, we'd have it done yesterday and we'd be prepared well in time. Um, and of course, in a monetary union with now 19 member states with different interests, with different problems, it's sometimes uh, difficult to find that um, uh, agreement quickly. So I think um, EDIS, let's not forget that we have an agreement on fully harmonized deposit insurance schemes. Every member state now must build, proactively build up a um, deposit insurance system and a, a deposit insurance fund, which I think is a good thing in itself, but also will make it a lot easier at some point, hopefully sooner than later, to have that single or European uh, scheme, because it's simply a matter of integrating the funds that are already being built up. If you realize now what little we had when we went into the banking crisis, I mean, it's pretty disgraceful. We told our uh, deposit holders that they were insured, but very few member states had any preparation in place, had any uh, fund build up. Um, many member states had banking sectors um, in size and in risks out of their span of control, basically. <coughs> so I think, you know, we've made a lot of progress already. Banking sectors are already much better capitalized, are better supervised. Uh, we are building up uh, deposit uh, insurance funds. We are building up a resolution fund. We have the frameworks. So uh, things are a lot more stable and we can manage uh, shocks better already. Should we get it done quickly? Yes. Uh, bail in. I think one of the key problems that's holding us back, and this is true for the issue of bail in in Italian banks, uh, EDIS. Um, which is not popular in Germany, or how we deal with MPLs. We want to go to the perfect setup of the banking union, but we have to deal with legacy issues. Um, if there were no legacy issues in our banks, not MPL problems in different countries, um, then I think it would be very easy to, to today take that step to have that EDIS, that European common insurance system. Uh, so that's why I keep pushing Let's not wait for it, uh, but let's do things in parallel. While we are all trying to deal with MPLs and progress is being made, um, uh, we should gradually enter into this European deposit insurance scheme. We've designed it, I mean, it was very te technical or technocratic, if you want. We've designed the same kind of mechanism in the single resolution fund 
where all of us, are, or all of the banks, I should say, it's luckily not public money, it's bank money, all of the banks are contributing to building up this resolution fund, and gradually over time we are mutualizing the debt, uh, sorry, the risks. So if any problem occurs, in, uh, I believe in 80 years' time, you can use the money of all of the fund and not just the national contributions. The same kind of approach uh, and how it will be designed exactly, let's get into it. Um, the same kind of approach we should take, we could take in uh, the deposit insurance uh, scheme. So my, my, my key issue would be let's not stop us from taking steps to that complete banking union because we're still struggling with legacy issues. We have to go through them in parallel. Thank you. Now we're open to the floor. The interest rate at the moment is zero. Never has there been a better time for governments to borrow for investment. And at the same time, the, the current construction within the Eurozone is such that governments are literally prohibited from making a set from major investments that will help to create sustainable growth in the future. But I think at a time when alternative energy, etc., the environment, all these things are so necessary. And let's face it, there are countries within the Eurozone in a very good position to invest. And I think we're missing a historic opportunity because I'm very depressed when you talk about the near-term prospects because there's so much money available for investment at, offering a far higher return than 0%. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roland. So, um, first of all, the points that I, I hear this a lot, that um, the Eurozone countries are so much worse than the non-Euros. So it's interesting to look at some of these examples. Um, for example, uh, Sweden and Denmark. Um, Sweden had a major banking crisis in the 90s and sorted it out heavy-handedly, nationalized all the major banks, deep restructuring, deep recapitalization, very strict uh, macroprudential policies. Uh, and yes, they went into the crisis in 2008 in a completely different position uh, than many of uh, our countries were. Was that to do with the fact that they were Euro or non-Euro? No, they had the crisis already before we even had the Euro. So, I mean, look at Sweden. The reason why the Swedes got through the crisis so much uh, better is because they sorted out their banks uh, and their policies uh, already before the crisis. Um, uh, Finland did uh, actually quite well in the crisis, uh, only had an, sort of an adverse, almost asymmetrical shocks uh, two years ago, three years ago. So in the first years, when all of us went in the slumps, Finland did fine, and that was a Euro country. Uh, Ch Czechia and Slovakia. Slovakia became uh, a Euro country uh, during the crisis years, has done very, very well economically. Uh, and Czechia, uh, the Czech Republic, has done a, a lot less than Slovakia. Uh, Neighbours, Euro country, non-Euro. So if you realise that 90% or more of our policies and how our economies are doing is still uh, influenced by national politics and national structural elements in our uh, economies, you need to look a little deeper. I've had this debate with, uh, with Stiglitz, uh, when we crossed arms in, uh, in Amsterdam, he made exactly this point. He said, just look at the non-euros, and it's so much better. If you zoom into it, the differences are much more distinctive than just euro and non-euro. <coughs> anyway, on should we now all spend more? It very much depends on what the fiscal situation is. If your debt is at 130%, uh, and um, investments uh, on the private side are already low, I'm not sure that's very good idea. I would go for really reforming your economies, reforming your legal system, reforming how your competitiveness rules are, etc. Making sure that, first of all, you start increasing private investments in your economy instead of, on top of that, let's say 130% uh, debt to GDP, uh, increasing uh, your uh, spending. Um, in uh, Germany and the Netherlands, a lot, uh, this is of course the, the, the other example, there is fiscal space, debt is relatively low, uh, the governments can borrow at 0%, um, but yet the economy is booming. Why would the government, in a period when the economy is at uh, 3 or 3.5% three already, and a lot of stress is building up in the housing market again, uh, etc., why would the government then start spending uh, a spending spree? I mean, economically, in terms of uh, being counter-cyclical, it doesn't uh, make sense. 
Uh, by the way, the investments in um, solar energy and wind energy in those countries are extremely high, and they need less and less government subsidies. So uh, with a very small incentive, we can trigger private investments in huge wind parks in the North Sea. It doesn't require a big public spending spree. So here again, I'd look really more specific at countries rather than saying let's start spending a lot of uh, money. Thank you. It seems to me there's a, there's a non-euro country not too far away that hasn't been doing spectacularly well either. Please, Peter. Um, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, Paul Sweeney is my name. Um, I, tomorrow, as you probably know, more than 90 fascist uh, members of parliament will take their seats in Germany. And I agree a lot of progress has been made in Europe in recent years, but that kind of thing that's happening, the rise of the far right is quite worrying. In Ireland, our anti-tax parties are on the far left. Um, it's, we're quite unusual on, on this. They're particularly opposed to property taxes, which I think are rather good taxes. anti-tax parties are on the far left. Yeah. yeah. Right, I'm just letting that And they've really yeah. done, they've really milked it, but it's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. But my question is, um, I'm a member of the Economic Committee of the European Trade Union Confederation, and last week we had a meeting, and we had a paper put before us, uh, a technical services note to the Eurogroup, which I found, and others found, very disturbing. And it seems to me, and my question really is, and I'll, I'll explain what's in the paper in a minute, um, that this kind of paper is playing into the hands of the right, and in Ireland's case, the far, far left. It's basically an anti-tax paper. You're, it's a paper against social charges, which you call financing labor tax cuts. And in it, the word tax is used 17 times and appended to the word tax every time, 17 times, is the word burden. Now, I have a number of questions to ask you. Do you think that tax is a burden? Do you think that tax is theft? Do you think that tax is a charge or a payment? If it's a burden and you're a public servant, are you a burden? You know, you have to use your words very carefully and there's a use amongst technical people to use the language of the far right um, and if you're disparaging taxes, which I am proud to pay myself and make a point of paying every penny because I believe I, I'm buying civilization, but the whole anti-tax uh, coming from you, and you're a social democrat, that's the surprise. Now, of course, you didn't write this paper. It was addressed to you. But uh, you know the paper, I'm sure. But essentially, it's all about reducing employers' PRSI. You must be aware that the labor share of national income has fallen by 10% in many European countries in recent years. And this is a move to make it fall further. Let me make a remark about the rise of the extreme right in, uh, in Europe. Uh, because it's, uh, of course, extremely uh, worrying. And some people have said that the outcome of the elections in the Netherlands and France uh, has been quite moderate. I don't agree with that. Extreme right has, again, uh, grown in number of seats in the Dutch parliament. And they've done extremely uh, well in a, a pre a presidential elections in, uh, in France. So that worry is very much alive. <clears throat> and I very much share that. I'm not sure that it's a, a Euro uh, issue. I think the, the populism and the, is just as strong and the same kind of movement is going on in the US. So um, I'm not sure that the Euro crisis is a whole uh, 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 explanation. I do believe that the fact that ordinary working people have not seen a wage improve, and this is true for the US and Europe, for a very, very long time is one of the uh, factors. Um, in the Netherlands, um, the, let's say, uh, average disposable income for working people hasn't improved since 2001. So it's been for 15, 16 years, completely flat. Um, the paper you refer to is about the tax uh, wedge on labor. Why is that problematic and why do I think it's problematic? I, I, I presume it's with drawn up by the Commission, but we asked for it, because um, um, the factor labor in our economy is being taxed so heavily that it's become very interesting for, of course, employers and in the economy to have as little labor as possible. Uh, so economically, I think it will make a lot of sense to shift that, lay, uh, that tax 
pressure away from labor and to, for example, to uh, consumption or to uh, um, uh, green taxes or to um, uh, 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 capital uh, taxes. Um, so that's what the, um, uh, the paper is about. <coughs> uh, I, I'm also proud to pay tax. I very much agree. Um, and I think we should look carefully at who's actually paying it um, and how we can make sure that the fact uh, labor is not, on the one hand, not improving its wages, and on the other hand, is being taxed very heavily, uh, and increasingly so over the crisis years. So there is the two sides. I've been pushing in my country, uh, but I don't have direct influence on it, uh, in wage, on wage increases. I think there is a lot of space to improve wages in, in the Netherlands, and the same is true in Germany. Uh, and I've been pushing and working on reducing the tax wedge on um, uh, labor's income. I th simply want people to have more money in their pay pocket. Uh, how do you call it? It's pay package. Pay package. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that doesn't mean that we have to go along with the sort of the anti-tax. By the way, I'm not sure that the extreme right or the populist right uh, are uh, anti-tax. I'm maybe in some countries, but certainly not everywhere. It strikes me that the populist right uh, are also very much in favor of uh, the welfare state uh, and early retirement ages and welfare schemes. Uh, if you look at um, the populist party in uh, the Scandinavian countries and in Denmark, one of their key agenda points is hands off of the social welfare state. So the, the, the image that you describe of the extreme right being anti-tax and anti-government, etc., is certainly for the, some of the extreme right populist parties uh, not, not quite correct. Uh, David Cron. It, in the, uh, um, the Commission's uh, paper on fiscal policy that was produced with the, the last year's, or the end of year's um, uh, annual growth survey, it was critical of the lack of a fiscal stance at the euro area level and that it was producing suboptimal uh, governance because within in a time of downturn it tended to be pro-cyclical uh, making recovery in some member states even more difficult and that um, uh, what was needed was a repartition or that's what that was their word, but I think that means a division of the fiscal effort into individual member states. Um, do you do you go along with that at all? And I don't. I'm not quite sure how it would be done either. So this, uh, um, the fiscal stance for the eurozone as a whole has been debated ever since Maastricht, and already then um, uh, some people said we shouldn't just have fiscal rules for member states, but we should look at the whole. Uh, integrated fiscal stance. Uh, it was never decided that way, so the whole rule book, so to speak, has been designed on the fiscal uh, efforts of member states. And the complex situation is now that in the member states that uh, are economically doing well, uh, there there is fiscal space. So there, economically there is not much, not many arguments for uh, Germany to start spending heavily, even though you could argue that the infrastructure in Germany or the educational system in Germany really could require an investment. Um, um, but in other countries where there is very little fiscal space and the rules would require them to take a, a contractionary sort of approach in their budget, uh, in those countries there's a huge demand for investments, also public investments. So that we, ha we haven't solved it yet. Uh, and every time people say, let's have a fiscal stance for the Eurozone, I'm, I, the problem is how to then implement it. So the Commission now says, over the whole of the Eurozone, uh, a neutral fiscal stance will be appropriate, meaning not contractionary but not expansionary. It doesn't really mean anything, because in some countries there really would be, in economic terms, need for some public investments. And in other countries, uh, economically, not really. Uh, I don't have the answer to it. I think it's, it's become a, a sort of a symbolic debate. Uh, some would argue that the real answer is having a fiscal capacity, a budget at a European level, in which you can then uh, f level it out between these countries. 
Um, that would, of course, only work if it's really sizable. Um, so having a small fiscal capacity, a small Eurozone budget, I don't think will help us very much. I mean, it can be for a short period of time, for a few small member states, you could use it. But uh, for larger member states or uh, real adverse shocks. If we want to have in the future a really sizable and effective fiscal capacity for the Eurozone, we need to discuss whether some of the major policy areas that are now in national hands, that we are prepared to give away that sovereignty. What do national governments spend their money on? Welfare systems, pension systems, health care, and hopefully some on educational systems. So these are the big uh, costly policy areas. So if we really want to create a Eurozone fiscal capacity of some size, you would have to give some of this up. Otherwise, I don't see how we can um, shift fiscal capacity to the Eurozone uh, level. That debate is only just starting. So, I mean, there are lots of people who say we need, as a monetary union, to have that sizable fiscal capacity, but no one has really discussed where does the money come from. I will presume it comes from national budgets. We then shift it to the Eurozone budget. What policy area would go with it? Um, some discussion now about uh, uh, unemployment benefit schemes. Shouldn't we have a Eurozone unemployment uh, insurance uh, system? Um, I think that's quite interesting, uh, but it will be for the future. Why do I say that? Because economically and politically, we are so far apart how labor markets are designed and works. Uh, some countries don't even have an unemployment benefit scheme. I mean, maybe from my perspective, that's hard to imagine, but this is the situation. Some countries have very strong, very sort of elaborate um, uh, unemployment benefit scheme, but then the governance is very different. In some countries, these funds, social funds, are actually owned by the unions or are owned by or run by the social partners. In some countries, it's an integrated part of the government budget run by the government. So, I mean, we really need to think deeper about what it means when we say we want a sizable, in the future, fiscal capacity in the Eurozone. It's about these topics. Um, and in this, in this country, probably a referendum. Wait. Indeed. Yes. So here. This here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Patrick Flanagan. Um, just two questions very briefly. Um, in your remarks, you talked about uh, a reform uh, fund effectively at the Commission level to support reform within member states. And then you also talked about uh, an, a European IMF uh, type institution. Uh, to, su to support reforms. How would you envisage those being financed, either at an annual basis from national budgets of, of member states or by a capital infusion into some type of, uh, into some type of institution? And secondly, just uh, as, you, as you're hearing, as you said that you're, uh, you're, in, you're stepping down soon as the, the Dutch finance minister, just in that role, just, to, just one question. Last year, um, uh, you agreed uh, the banking sector agreement with civil society organizations, uh, with major Dutch banks and the, and the Dutch government. Um, it was with, I think it was with Oxfam and then the major banks in, in, in the Netherlands. I'm wondering if you could comment on its implementation and, and do you see that type of agreement as something that could be used in other European countries, either at a national level or, or as a European-wide agreement? Thank you. Right. Um, on the, the, the funding uh, side, I think we're going into a very difficult debate anyway about the multi-annual uh, framework, uh, the financial framework, which is about the seven-year period of the EU budget. It's going to be usually complex anyway, so let's make it even more complex. Uh, it's going to be complex because the UK is leaving, and they are, of course, a net contributor, um, uh, and it will have huge effects on... Uh, the next net contributor, uh, but also the recipient uh, countries, are we going to downscale the budget to the size of the UK population or the UK contribution? Uh, and how are we going to um, redistribute the, the costs? So that, that's one uh, element. I think another one is um, 
the financing of the common agricultural policy. I know this is in, in Ireland also followed very closely, but that debate's also uh, going on. Um, and here the position of countries is changing. Um, should that remain fully communitarian or should it be renationalized to some extent? I think that could also be part of that uh, discussion. There is a discussion which I'm very interested in is about um, European public goods. What is it that the EU ha actually has an added value? Uh, what policy areas? And obviously a lot of attention goes to migration, border control, uh, security, anti-terrorism. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a federalist in the sense that I think everything should be done at a European level. And as long as it's done at a European level, it's the best answer to whatever the problem is. I don't, I don't agree with that. But there are some very strong cases where doing it jointly at an EU level uh, would be much better. And uh, border control, I think, is very obvious. Uh, most of our internal borders uh, are gone in Schengen. Um, um, and we didn't organize uh, the outside border control. So let's do that. But it will require, really, a development of institutions and budget, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the same would go for uh, cooperation on defense uh, issues. Um, so I think creating space inside the EU budget for these EU public goods, security, migration, border control, will also require quite a puzzle. Uh, perhaps even extending the budget. But that's easy for me to say, as I'm leaving my job as finance minister, if I would be responsible the next five years, I would not be so eager. But um, there is a strong case here. And then on top of that, we want to create a new instrument. I think we should look at the structural funds as we know them. Not to take away the money, but to say we want to <coughs> connect these transfers from the structural funds to a reform program or reform efforts that countries are, are going through, and how can we uh, make them work in parallel. Um, so that's the kind of funding I would be uh, looking at. But it's going to be a hugely difficult debate about the EU budget. Uh, the second point, uh, question was about the um, agreement which we have in the Netherlands with the, the banks. This is about um, sustainability, human rights. And the banks have agreed that they will respect all international standards regarding human rights, that they will um, um, uh, take a huge responsibility for sustainability, the climate issue. Um, it's still in development. I mean, if you want to know, is it, is it a huge success? I think in itself that the banks with the government and the NGOs came to such an agreement uh, was already a huge success. Uh, the next step will be transparency. Uh, they need to become much more transparent on where do they actually invest their money, uh, how do they um, uh, in practice fulfill these commitments. So I'm, I'm positive, I'm optimistic. Ask me again in five years' time and I'll tell you whether it's been a huge success. We are actually trying to do that with different sectors of the economy. Uh, to, it's a very sort of Dutch way. Um, I don't know whether you know this world, we, we, we like to call it the polder model. Um, the Netherlands, um, most part of the Netherlands is of course below sea level and the only way we can keep our feet dry is by uh, having this polder model. The polder is the, 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 low, the low land below sea level and we have all kinds of institutions and, uh, and negotiations and talks and tables around which we sit to organize the fact that the Netherlands remains dry. So this is where the word polder model comes from. We like to sit down and have sort of a national agreement with, in this case, the banks, but we try to do that in different sectors. It is said, as you probably know, that if the Dutch had been born in Ireland, they'd be the richest people in the world. And if the Irish had been born in the Netherlands, they'd all have drowned centuries ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Rafik Mortier. I have a very simple question. In the a Bretton Woods arrangement, the emphasis is always on the, de the, the, de the deficit countries through the adjustment. And something similar seems to be happening in the Euro area. Mm -hmm. It is always the deficit countries that have to do all the work rather than the surplus countries. And in the Euro area, this is quite clear, the German surplus becomes bigger and bigger because the deficit countries have to do all the work. How do you arrange or what kind of pr proposals have the Euro group discussed in relation to making the adjustment much more 
balance between the surplus countries and the deficit countries. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. The rules are much more strict on one side of the balance than on the other. Um, so I think that um, Germany, I think Germany is very much aware of this and that the way that it works, but is also very re reluctant to become responsible for some of the more domestic problems that uh, our colleagues have. Um, and this is very much about the, f the feeling that the Germans have that they always have to pick up the bill in Europe and have to pay for whatever uh, risks uh, occur. Um, but I think the answer is twofold. So as long as we don't have a more balanced sort of mechanism on two sides, deficit and surplus countries, uh, I think the Germans should look at, and I think they are, at um, investing more, for example, in infrastructure, uh, but also the educational system in Germany is, is not the, 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 the highest ranking. Um, and another way to re-address uh, this issue is by increase of wages. Um, and there really is a lot of room for wage improvement in the German economy. Uh, and I was at the IMF meetings uh, um, a week ago in Washington, and one of the things that struck me is that the economists really don't know the answers anymore, and the politicians uh, don't have the, the power to, to do it. What do I mean by that? That everyone is puzzled in every room I was in in Washington by what's happening now in our economies in terms of technolog technological developments, uh, productivity very low, um, labor markets not strained, not even in the, the, the countries that have had a very strong economic recovery, uh, there is still very little push uh, on wage levels, upward push. So what's going on in our economies? Uh, and it struck me that uh, even the cleverest economists that always are in these meetings uh, couldn't really explain it. But it's a, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem in the US. It's a huge problem in more and more of the Eurozone countries. Why is it that the economy is booming? Uh, the private sector is uh, heavily investing, but we don't see anything in productivity and we don't see anything in wage increase. Um, but that's what should happen. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Harrison. Um, I was very struck by a point that you made that uh, when you said let's not be too quick to make private risks a, a public problem. And I wonder if you, you agree that there's a good case for being very cautious about making private responsibilities a public problem too. I mean, in, the, in, in the affairs of the banks over recent years, it's fairly clear that as well as uh, maybe failures of regulation, there have above and beyond that been major failures of corporate governance. And if you have a situation, uh, you may not want to co comment on a particular Irish issue at the moment, but should you have a situation where, frankly, the banks have scammed their customers over quite a serious period of time, it's not the first thing to do to turn around to the boards of those banks and actually to say to them, you have not exercised your corporate responsibility for ethical and responsible trading. For the period that you didn't do that, why should you be paid as directors? And if that failure to exercise it becomes willful, i.e. you don't do anything about it, why should you not be disqualified from being directors in future? Isn't just a case for saying governments have actually allowed the banks to blame their lack of corporate responsibility on hypothetical lack of regulation? Mm. Um. I agree. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that I, I don't think we need regulation, but regulation has sometimes become an excuse for those in charge of the, the banks or corporates to say, well, I've, I've stuck to the rules and regulations, so I'm fine. And that's not always the case. Uh, you can uh, give your customers a really bad and unfair deal and still be inside the law. And uh, I, I won't comment on the situation that's now all over your newspapers, but we've had exactly the same kind of examples in the Netherlands. Uh, schemes with derivatives being sold to small companies. These uh, company owners didn't have a clue how the derivatives worked, couldn't imagine how it could go wrong, and it did go wrong. Uh, and we're still sorting it out till now. We've had um, uh, huge scandals with uh, ink, I'm, I'm not sure what the English word would be, uh, sort of income uh, insurance policies 
in which uh, uh, private uh, people would pay in monthly terms, hoping that they would build up some kind of sort of little pension fund. But the administration costs that the banks made them pay every month uh, exceeded uh, the, the return on their investment. And this happened to 7 million people in the Netherlands, 7 million. So, I mean, and we've seen it in England, we've seen it in Italy, it's happened all over the place, mis-selling. And yes, I'm, I've been very active in regulating. And we've did lots of regulating at European level and at national level. But every time it boils down to the fact if the financial sector doesn't realize that uh, how important confidence between them and their customer is and how damaging these recurring incidents, I mean, is to that confidence, if they don't see it as their responsibility, we're never going to sort it out. Uh, we will have a highly dense regulation and um, thousands and thousands of people working uh, at the supervisor, uh, but um, we're never going to win that struggle. Uh, in the Netherlands, I don't know how you uh, have done it in Ireland, um, the, the supervisors need to check, do a, a, a fitness check on all the responsible top people in the financial sector. So before you can become anything at board level or even the level below that, you need to be uh, uh, checked. And it's a check on um, your personal ethical behavior, uh, also whether you've paid your taxes, but also on how you've done in previous jobs in the financial sector. And if you've been in some way responsible for a scandal in your institution, you may lose your approval to work in the financial sector. And uh, this has had quite a sort of a shock effect because you can lose basically your professional uh, license. It's, it's an unfortunate way to do it, but it has, that may have worked. Yeah, the point is frequently made that in the United States, for example, where financial institutions have been fined huge amounts of, of, of money, that it simply doesn't solve the problem because the people who cause the difficulty still stay there or they get paid a large amount of money to leave. Yeah, and the, share, like the shareholders pay the, um, yes. the, yeah. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then I'll, I'll write, uh, the, uh, the, um, the issue I'm asking about is you, you mentioned about high debt, high debt countries. Obviously, the Eurozone, there's a few of them that are. But one stands out like a sore thumb, and it's been an ongoing issue, uh, i.e., Greece. How do you see Greece playing out uh, going forward? And, they sh you know, and if Greece were forced out or uh, actually left of their own volition, could the Eurozone, Eurozone survive? I.e., one goes, can you, can you bring friends to the rest of them? Well, I think if you look at how much political capital has been spent. Uh, on keeping uh, Greece in sight, I'm sure that we're not going down that road of what if and could it happen. I don't think anyone is going down that road again. Uh, and I mean literally political capital spent. Governments have fallen in the Eurozone over Greece. And I'm not talking about the Greek government. Uh, so a lot of political capital spent uh, in the determination to keep the Eurozone intact and keeping Greece in. Um, so, the situation with Greece is, of course, as I said in my speech, many of the problems that we had during the crisis were already caused in the years before, and that was certainly true for Greece. Um, uh, institutions uh, very weak, the whole society and the economy very politicized. Everything is, in the end, uh, decided by the politicians, and if the government changes, then it, it works all the way down into the economy people lose their jobs and get replaced. And so it's, it's a major effort to introduce sound governance throughout the private and public sector. Um, but it's happening and it's, it's, it's gradually taking place. It's, it's slow, it's tough, but it is happening and I think it's key uh, for confidence to return to Greece. So uh, in 2014, already Greece was coming out of the crisis. It had some growth, unemployment was going down, investors were returning, and then um, the Syriza government came in, and in 2015, everything collapsed, and we had to start all over again. Now we're in the third uh, program. Things are back on track. So my key point is 
uh, and I made it when I was in Athens, is, is about stability. Uh, create stability, gradually keep on working on the reform agenda. Uh, we will help to stabilize the uh, economy. We will also help to manage the debt burden. Uh, a lot has been done there. We've basically flattened out their sort of annual debt burden, the, the amounts that they have to pay on an annual basis. We've completely flattened it out for the next 20 years. So the debt is still high, but what they have to do to service it on an annual basis is, is very manageable. And we stand ready, if they do their part, we stand ready to do more if, if necessary. Um, and the program ends in 18, the summer of 18, summer next year. The, the size of the program is something like 86 billion, but I don't think we'll use half of what is needed, so that's also a good sign. Uh, we'll stay well below that 86 uh, billion, um, and that also helps uh, the debt uh, issue. And at the end of the program, summer next year, we will look again at how sustainable the debt is and what need, more needs to be done. But stability is very much the key to, to get that confidence back. Thank you. A final question would be Mary Cross, who is chairing our reflection group on the future of EU27. Thank you. Mary. Minister, thank you for a very clear expose. I suppose my question in a way is more political than, uh, than economic. You laid a lot of stress on convergence, and I just wonder if you feel confident that you can keep moving forward in this direction, because there's quite a lot of discussion in the papers we have from Europe at the moment, uh, and it's swirling around in the EU, about groups of countries moving forward in certain areas. And obviously, uh, a danger is that the Eurozone may move forward and leave, uh, create a chasm with other non-Euro member states. And this is obviously uh, a worry uh, for all of European member states. So how do you keep them moving, uh, moving together, uh, particularly with the wide variety of types of countries not in the Euro already? Yeah. Well, I think uh, Jean-Claude Juncker is right when he says that it, in principle we should really push and help uh, countries to gradually catch on and connect to the, Euro, <coughs> the Eurozone because it's quite complex. I think the integration uh, of the Eurozone countries will continue, uh, sometimes with shocks, sometimes gradually, but this process will continue. Uh, and it will create political issues if a number of countries sort of follow up or get disconnected. Um, the appetite to become a, a Euro country wasn't, of course, very strong uh, during the Eurozone crisis, uh, but at the moment the Eurozone is doing better, uh, on average, uh, than the non-Euro countries. And that is something that a couple of years ago no one would have uh, expected. Uh, there is interest now in um, Denmark and Sweden to become part of the Banking Union. The Banking Union is, of course, now Eurozone member states, but it's an open concept. Anyone can join, uh, EU members, um, and I think they will. Um, so I would be very much in favor without forcing countries. I don't think that could ever work, but to try and keep countries as involved as possible. That could be in the Banking Union, uh, sort of as a halfway station uh, <coughs> integrating into the Eurozone. Um, I can't solve it completely. I think the integration in the Eurozone will uh, continue, uh, it will progress. And if countries say, well, we simply don't want to be, then they will be a different kind of uh, member. Yeah. Thank you, Jeroen. Thank you very much indeed for your frankness and straightforwardness in, in, in dealing with the issues. Um, I, I'm sure I speak for a good many people here, if not for everybody, when I say that I've been struck by your frequent references to convergence. And we look forward very much to seeing the results of that kind of thinking coming through in your work for the, uh, the, the ESM. Thank you very much indeed for Thank coming. You. Thank you.